Oh, which one do I go? What's the best way of going? Um, I have a rental. Just ice pen to 75. Or you can do, if you want to do back roads, 90. Is there anything scenic? Not really. <laughs> no, I didn't think so. There's old towns. And they just did the Civil War battle reenactment. Oh, really? Yeah, it was Battle of Olufsen. near Lake City. I've never been to a Civil War reenactment. It's interesting. Some people get into it. You know? Yeah, I've never... They don't have that in New York. Are you? Uh, do you have all the access to the, uh, the AV setup? I think I'm good to go. Pretty much just uh, <laughs> yes, Hello. Josh Black. Right. Pleasure. Thank you so much for coming. All right. Well, they're obviously here for you. No, they're here for the food. <laughs> they're here for the food. Um, yeah, can you, you dim the lights right in front of the screen? How's that? Okay. Yeah. If you guys need anything at all, we'll be up in the tech office. Um, for, your, for your airplane reading. Thank you, sir. Sure. So, Ali will introduce you. Sure. And, uh, you okay, so do we have to be here at, uh, at a specific time? One thirty. Oh, we have to one thirty. Okay, perfect. That, that's plenty of time. And I'll leave some time for you for questions and answers. Wonderful. And do you guys have to dart the class after this? Are you you're around? Yeah. I'm around. I'm go get some lunch after this. You around? Fine. Oh, I'm not, I'm not counting any of this for me.
Take your time. Take your time. Yeah. Thank you again for the introduction. You can keep it short as possible. I don't need anything lengthy. Okay. Yeah. Short as possible. Uh, let's see. I'll cut off. <laughs> I just I use the bed sock uh, bio. So. And that's fine. You, you, you don't need to say we're at the law school and stuff. Just I, I don't like long bios. Um, I try to be as formal as humanly possible. Today, good? Good. I come to Florida and this is what I get. This is not this is not what I bargained for. I was in I've been in D Detroit and Minneapolis to get bad with there, but here, not not good. Well, thank you to Glenn and Allie and everyone else at the Federal Society for inviting me in, Professor Kaplan also for uh sorry, Professor Cap for commenting on the talk. So we're here to talk about something that affects each and every one of you. And you may not know this, but the challenge to stop Obamacare began right here in Tallahassee. It was your former Attorney General and Solicitor General who took the lead 
in filing lawsuits on behalf of 20 states to challenge the Affordable Care Act. So we have a very special Tallahassee bond uh, for this case. Okay? So what is Obamacare? So first, let's just talk about the terminology. I'm going to use the word Obamacare because the president uses the word Obamacare. Shortly after the case that upheld the law, he gave an interview where he said he'll be proud if historians call it Obamacare. Uh, at some times it's considered pejorative, at other times it's considered accurate. I will use it, and that's what we'll call it. So this is a story about all three branches of our government clashing, the president, the Congress, and the judiciary. And they clashed over the meaning of the Constitution and how it relates to health insurance. So let's go through some of the basics first. Health insurance is very, very expensive. And there have been many efforts in this country to try to lower the cost of health care to make it more affordable. Uh, who knows what this picture is? Here are my litmus test for how old you are. He's, he's laughing. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, we have a student. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, pejoratively known as Hillary Care. This was uh, First Lady Robin Clinton's uh, attempt in the early 1990s to uh, impose some sort of universal health care for the United States. Uh, it didn't work. In a large part, it didn't work because of these commercials. Now, who knows what these commercials are from? What's it, which, what are these commercials from? Do you remember? Oh. No, no, no. These are the Harry and Louise commercials, right? These were commercials that ran during the 1990s of this, of this Midwestern ma and pa sitting around a dinner table saying, I don't know, ma. With this health care plan, I might lose my doctor, right? I like my doctor. I don't want to lose my doctor. This simple commercial helped torpedo the Affordable Care Act, uh, helped, helped torpedo Hillary Care for one very simple reason. People were not willing to change what they had. They were primarily happy with what they had. And if you actually look at polling data uh, from the, uh, from the uh, years before the ACA was enacted, roughly 80% of Americans were happy with the health insurance. Now, the other 20% were probably very unhappy or didn't have it at all. But by and large, most people were content with it. So the, so the memo went out. Any efforts to reform health care must be premised on a promise that you can keep your insurance if you like it. Okay? So remember that promise going forward. So throughout the rest of the 90s and 2000s, there was no real effort to try to make health care more affordable. But when President Obama came to office, he made this his first priority for his first term in office. Okay? So it's actually a, a, a good fact. Does anyone know what record President uh, Obama shares with Pre uh, President Roosevelt with respect to oaths of office? You know this one? Yeah. How many times? Four. Ready? Watch. Count. So in 2009, when the president was inaugurated, he and the chief justice, they flubbed the oath. Remember that? They messed up the oath. So they did a do-over the next day at the White House. Fast forward to 2013, right? The president was supposed to be sworn in on January 8th. That's what the Constitution says. That was a Sunday. So they did a fake one, a fake one in the Capitol the next day, and the real one the day before. So it's actually taking the oath of office four times, and uh, each time the take care clause must have been just uh, taken out. So we have the president coming to office with his goal of reforming health care. And the law was called the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Now, we don't talk about patient protection anymore. We don't even hear that. It's either just Affordable Care Act, ACA, or what I'll call it just Obamacare. Okay? So let's explain at a very basic level how this law works. Health insurance, for some people, is very expensive. Okay? If they're sick or they're old or they have various pre-existing conditions, it can be very expensive. Health insurance, for most other people, is not as expensive. If you're young and you're healthy, you don't consume a lot of health care. The goal of the ACA to oversimplify is to kind of spread what are called risk pools. Okay? It's to try to make the cost of insurance lower for certain people who have sicknesses and diseases and such, but invariably that will raise costs elsewhere. Now, the ACA tries to have various cost saving mechanisms, but at its heart it tries to spread the risk pools, get more people into the market, paying into insurance, and this will lower the cost all around. Okay? Now, the key component of the ACA is something called the individual mandate. The purpose of the individual mandate is just that, to mandate that people buy health insurance. Those who fail to buy insurance pay a penalty, it's a percentage of their income, it fluctuates each year. Okay? By forcing people to enter the healthcare market and buy insurance, we expand these risk pools and we can lower costs all over the, over the aggregate. Okay? So that's the first provision. The second provision re reflects Medicaid. Okay? When Medicaid was first created in the 1960s, it said if you were at the poverty line, whatever the poverty line happens to be in your area, you were entitled to this government-funded uh, insurance called Medicaid. 
the ACA said we will expand Medicaid. If you are at one, excuse me, 133 percent of the poverty line, so you're somewhere above the poverty line, still pretty poor, but not at the poverty line, you are now eligible for Medicaid. So what the ACA said was states, you are required to now offer Medicaid to all these new people. Okay. These are the two main provisions of the law. There are many others which I won't talk about. Why are these two provisions so important? They're most important because there were constitutional doubts as to these laws. Okay, so let me explain them uh, 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 in, in twofold. The first one was, could Congress mandate that people buy a commercial product, right? Could Congress force people to buy insurance? Okay, the second issue was, could Congress force the states to expand Medicaid to include all these new million people? All right, I'll go through the arguments in a bit. But let's talk about the background of the law itself. As the ACA was winding its way through the Capitol, right, we had this movement pop up. This was called the Tea Party. And the Tea Party was this, 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 this social movement that kind of grew up, not quite spontaneously, but close to it. And they grounded their opposition mostly on Obamacare. Um, and they didn't just oppose Obamacare from a policy perspective, they certainly did. They actually opposed it from a constitutional perspective. They said this law is not constitutional. And over the months leading to the ACA's passage, the, the Tea Party grew and grew and grew to the point you had tens of thousands of people marching on Washington uh, uh, asking uh, to stop the passage of Obamacare. And it was, it's quite remarkable if you actually went to some of those rallies, you would see signs that say, overturn Wicker v. Filbert, right? And, and yeah. I'll show one laugh, right? And we have a governor of enumerated powers, right? I mean, they were certainly opposed to Obama and opposed to Obamacare, but they grounded the argument in the constitutional text and history. And in our history, when, when movements ground their arguments in the Constitution, it takes on a different level of salience and, and, and makes it a much more profound argument. But alas, the constitutional challenge, I'm sorry, the, the opposition to it from a political perspective would lose for one very simple reason. In 2008, the Democrats cleaned out. They had 60 votes in the Senate. And what do you get with 60 votes in the Senate? No filibuster, right? They could block any filibuster on any law as long as their 60 vote cohort held tight, which wasn't a given. Uh, <laughs> there was a lot of finagling to get all those 60 votes together, right? But Harry Reid, the master tactician, was able to keep his caucus together. And this became the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010, okay? Does anyone know how many pages? No cheating. How many pages the, the actual law is? How many? Double it. But almost 3,000 pages, depending on the pagination. Okay? The final version of the bill in its final form was released in the Senate, uh, like December 10th, 2009. And they were scheduling a Christmas Eve vote. Okay? Why were they scheduling a Christmas Eve vote? Well, this wasn't meant to be the final passage. They just wanted to have all their members on record as voting so they can go home to their constituents and tell everyone how wonderful this new law is going to be and you know, promote it over the Christmas break. So they wanted to have this Christmas Eve vote. But the law as it stood then was not in its final version. It was what we call a draft bill. There were still lots of bugs to work out, all these things to iron out. The things were missing. It wasn't meant to be the final version. They thought, okay, we'll do this now on Christmas Eve. We'll come back in the new year. We'll fix it up and make a beautiful, perfect uh, health care reform law. So they passed this on a straight party line vote, 60 votes yay, 39 nay. Uh, on Christmas Eve 2009, okay? But then something odd happened. That previous summer, Senator Ted Kennedy had passed away, okay? He was the 60th vote in the Senate. Then something crazier happened. Scott Brown. Let's put this in perspective. Scott Brown ran as a Republican in Massachusetts on the promise of stopping Obamacare. A Republican took Ted Kennedy's seat in Massachusetts as a 41st vote to stop Obamacare. This was stunning. Scott Brown was elected and said, you know what? I'm the 41st vote. No more Obamacare. And actually, when Scott Brown won, many of the White House thought that health care reform was dead. They said, we're not going to get this past Republicans. Let's just quit and give up, right? We're not going to do this. But quitters never win, says Nancy Pelosi. So... How are they going to achieve this? Well, we all listened to Schoolhouse Rocks when we were a kid, and we know that you know a bill passes one house, and a bill passes the other house, and the president signs it. And that's, that's a lovely way of making laws. It's called bicameralism and presentment. But, but that wasn't going to work here, right? <laughs> For one very important reason. The House couldn't pass the Senate version of the bill. 
Why couldn't the House pass it? Because, as I said, it wasn't the final version. It wasn't complete. They rushed it to get it to the floor for this Christmas Eve vote. There are lots of provisions that have to strip out, things that have to change, things that have to add, things that have to delete. So usually, that's not a problem. You make some changes in the Senate, then you send it to the House, the House makes some changes, send it back to the Senate. You know, it goes back and forth a couple times uh, you know, to, to, to fix it, right? But they couldn't do that here. Why? The second they send it back to the Senate, it'll be filibustered and killed. So, Pelosi has the idea, right? John Boehner's not happy with this. This is how big the law is, right? It's, it's huge. Pelosi has the idea of using something called the budget reconciliation process. The budget reconciliation process, which you've probably never heard of, is meant to reconcile budgets. So if the House passes one sort of budget and the Senate passes another budget, they can have a conference with, of members of the, both houses. They come together. They meet. They discuss. They iron out kinks. And then they can vote on it. But the key of the reconciliation process is there's no filibuster. You can't filibuster a reconciled bill. So what Pelosi do? Just that. She made all these changes in the House and sent it back to the Senate through the reconciliation process to avoid the filibuster. But there was never a committee that met to actually figure out the details. They made all the changes in the House by themselves, sent it back to the Senate, and then we have a crazy law that doesn't actually work. In part, because of this, there are a lot of bugs and errors that should have been worked out in this process, but because they were so hasty and urgent to pass it that we didn't get that. So now we're actually dealing with a lot of these issues now. That's why I have all these ad hoc changes in the fly to the law, because there are a lot of things that probably should have been fixed you know, in 2009, not in 2014. Anyway, so Pelosi says, we're going to pass this version of the law that never actually went to the Senate, and the President will sign it, and they'll go back to the Senate, and it goes back to the House, and then we have somehow by cameras and presentment for Obamacare. This is the manner in which Obamacare was passed by any means necessary. Uh, uh, the Scott Brown thing probably should have killed it, but they, they got it through by one way or another. Um, this was the final vote, and I want to just draw attention to two, two numbers. So the first one is that there were 34 Democrats who voted nay. So we had even significant opposition from the president's own party for this law. But the more important number is the one that's not there. C-SPAN doesn't even print it. If I go fast enough, I can make it. Zero, right? Zero Republicans, okay? Not a single Republican supported this law. 49% of Congress opposed this law. Half of America opposed this law. Now, you can say the Republicans were intransigent, they had no interest in supporting Obama. That's a fair assertion. I, th I think that that's a fair criticism. But that does nothing to the fact that half the country didn't want this law to begin with. And if you go back through American laws like the Social Security Act, the American Disabilities Act, the Civil Rights Act, go down the list, they were all passed with a bipartisan coalition. Lyndon Johnson would twist arms if the Civil Rights Act passed. All these laws had some sort of bipartisan buy-in. But this law was on a straight party line vote. And I think a lot of the animosity and acrimony that powered the 2010 elections, the 2012 elections, <laughs> it's going to be the 2014 elections, and maybe even 2016, would be because Obamacare did not have the buy-in, that they went it alone. Okay? So after all this electoral reconciliation process stuff, it goes to the White House. And the president signs off on it. It's actually kind of cool. If you see here, you have these uh, all these pens. He has 23 commemorative pens and uses each pen for a different stroke of his name. And he hands them out souvenirs. It's kind of a cool token. And and as the president was signing it, he made some comments to the effect of, uh, by the way, March 23rd, 2010. Remember that date. March 23rd, 2010. He says the battle over health care reform is over. The battle over health care reform. Is over in March 2010. Sadly, that would not prove to be the case. Why? Because of the Constitution. Within minutes after this law was signed, I mean, the ink wasn't even dry yet from all those pens. We had, we had lawsuits. So let's do a mini con law review for a moment. So who knows what case this is? Who can remember what case this is? Figure it out. Oh, you're quiet. Come on. What's, what's the guy doing? He's a farmer. Yeah, Wickard, yeah. Where could be Philbrim? What was Wickard? Uh, it was government was regulating how much uh, wheat people could grow, and he was growing wheat for himself uh, to feed his cows, and it turned mm -hmm. out that uh, this was a problem because everyone was growing wheat for themselves. They, they wanted to act on that. Everyone was applying to grow wheat for themselves. That 
Wickerby. Wickerby Filburn, right? This is the evil-looking Secretary of the Agriculture, Claude Wicker, with these little charts in the back. You can't see exactly just wheat over there. There's all these projections of how much wheat people should grow. Because during the Great Depression, the way to fix hunger is to grow less wheat. And th this is, yeah, go, go actually read the Agricultural Adjustment Act. It's a wonderful law. This is, this is farmer Fred Filburn from Ohio. And Filburn grew wheat on his own farm for his own consumption of those as animals. He says, hey, Congress, how can you regulate my wheat if my wheat never even leaves my farm, let alone the state? And what did the Supreme Court say? If you aggregate, if you take together his decision to grow his own wheat and his decision to grow his own wheat and her decision to grow her own wheat, on the aggregate, that will affect interstate commerce. Why? Because if he were to go to the market and buy wheat, that affects prices in the market. He's not buying wheat, right? Therefore, the prices will be higher or lower, whatever they are. So this case is the broad proposition that Congress can regulate economic activity within one state if it has some sort of effect outside the state. Okay? This is what we affectionately know call the Commerce Clause, right? <laughs> so there's another case. This one's harder. Who knows this case? It's not Terry Schiavo. That's why I always get, I always get Terry Schiavo. It's not Terry Schiavo. Who knows what case this is? Yeah. Case. Yes. This is Gonzalez versus Raich. Okay? What was Gonzalez versus Raich about? Uh, I wish it said that. No, it didn't say that. No, it did the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you took you took the Justice Thomas position. I think that was not the majority. Right. So Gonzalez v. Raich. This involves a woman, Angel Raich, she had an inoperable tumor, very ill, and the only thing that gave her any kind of uh, relief was medicinal marijuana. And under California law, this was perfectly legal. Under federal law, it's not. So she sued to say, hey, wait a minute. The, the, the weed I'm smoking comes from a local farm. You know, it's locally grown, got at Whole Foods. And, you know, it never crossed state lines. How is it possible that Congress can regulate this locally grown marijuana? The Supreme Court said just that. Her decision to buy local marijuana affects the interstate marijuana market. The interstate marijuana market. What that is, I don't know. But apparently this exists. And because it exists, Congress can regulate this product. Well, also, Justice Scalia concurred and said, well, I don't know about this commerce thing, but Congress can regulate drugs, and as a necessary and proper incident of the drug regulation market, we need to ban local marijuana. We can't have people growing themselves, whatever. This case was actually argued by Randy Barnett, who wrote the foreword for my book. Uh, this is Angel Raich finding out that she lost the case. It's very sad. All right. So what does wheat and weed, broccoli, okay? This was the defining vegetable of the entire challenge to Obamacare. Does anyone like broccoli? Who are you people? Does anyone not like broccoli? Oh, the few in the crowd. Okay, I can't stand it. I don't like it. It's gross, and you cannot make me eat it, goddammit. <laughs> no way. Right? What the heck does broccoli have to do with Obamacare? Well, it goes like this. Obamacare says... We will force you to buy health insurance because this will make society's health care market better, right? We will make you buy this product because this will lower costs and make things better. Okay. What else can we do with that power? Could they make you buy a gym membership because that might make you go to the gym and, and exercise and be healthier? Could they make you buy broccoli? You don't have to eat it, but maybe if it's in the house, you might want to eat it, and then you'll be healthier, right? What are the limits of the power? If the government can do stuff and make you engage in activity, to make uh, society healthier, where's the limit, right? Can they make you buy broccoli, right? <laughs> Can they make you eat it? Can they say, for your next vehicle, um, if, you, if you fail to buy a GM vehicle, it hits you with a $1,000 tax. At the time, GM was in receivership of the United States government, so that was actually not too implausible. Anyway, we go back to March 23, 2010. Obamacare is a law of the land. It cannot be changed. It cannot, that's it. It's, it's done. Anyway, within seven minutes, Seven minutes, your attorney general and your solicitor general filed a lawsuit. Actually, not here, but that's a funny story. So we all know the Capitol is right here in Tallahassee. Why did Florida decide to file the lawsuit in Pensacola? Hmm. So there's actually some chicanery here, which you maybe appreciate. But the, uh, the attorney general, in his, in his independent judgment, determined that the, uh, uh, there might be some judges in the Tallahassee area who might not be amenable to the challenge. And they thought that the bench in Pensacola 
would be more uh, amenable. If you actually do the math, which I've done, there were three Republican appointees on the bench in Pensacola, and it was more mixed than the Tallahassee bench. So rather than crossing the streets of the federal courthouse in Tallahassee, they schlepped over to Pensacola, and that's where they filed the lawsuit and in front of Judge uh, uh, Vincent. Okay? A little inside baseball there. So the first suit was actually brought by Ken Cuccinelli, the former Virginia Attorney General, who's now selling Stand Your Ground insurance. Uh, you heard about this? <laughs> Basically, you can buy an insurance policy, and they'll defend you if you use your gun in lethal self-defense. It, it, it's a total moral hazard. I don't even know how this is legal. But, but, I, but he's selling it. For eight bucks a month, you can get a defense if you kill someone with your gun. Anyway. Cooch won. He won. The president was not happy. The district court actually found that Congress can't force people to engage in this activity. They can't force people to buy a product. That all the previous cases involved regulation of activity. This case involved a regulation of economic inactivity. In other words, they were forcing you into commerce. Once you force someone into commerce, you can make them do whatever you want. Someone sitting on their butt at home doing nothing is not in commerce. They're not engaging in commerce. What this law does is it forces you into commerce. All right? The second shoe to drop was Judge Roger Vinson, who was a federal district judge in Pensacola. Okay? This suit was actually, I mentioned, led by the Florida Attorney General, but united 26 states. So basically half the union joined together in this case to oppose Obamacare. This was a big deal. And this is a good federalism point, which people don't appreciate. Why the heck was the state of Florida challenging an individual mandate that impacts individuals? See? Right, see? Why is it Florida challenging it? Well, there's two answers. The main reason they were in the case was because of Medicaid. Florida and these other states objected to have all the Medicaid But more importantly, and I think this is a good federalism point, the states were acting as protectors of the people's individual liberty. Right? The mandate acts on individuals in an area traditionally reserved to the police power of the state. By the feds coming in, they are displacing state autonomy over the people whom they represent. So Florida was actually serving a liberty play with our people. Think about that all time. Florida brought this case. I don't know if that's what they were thinking, but uh, that's how I can explain it. Anyway, Judge Vinson ruled in favor of the challengers. For 26 states, he found that the individual mandate was unconstitutional, that Congress can't force people to engage in interstate commerce. Although he left the Medicaid expansion intact, no one touched that yet. All right, so off to the courts of appeals we go. There were going to be several main challenges. Most of them were be argued by, uh, this was then acting Solicitor General Neil Katyal and uh, a wonder boy, Paul Clement, who is one of the best advocates in the world. He's great. Okay, so one of the first cases was in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. And in that case, uh, Judge Jeff Sutton, who's a prominent conservative judge, actually voted to uphold the ACA. And this was saying, wow, so now we have a conservative judge, federal society member, you know, rank and file, who's voting to uphold the ACA, okay? The president was very happy with that. But the main, but the main event was going to be the 11th Circuit in Atlanta. This was going to be the appeal from Pensacola. And this was the appeal that had 26 states argue, uh, uh, being represented by this point. And in a striking decision, the 11th Circuit actually found that the mandate was unconstitutional. They said that Congress can't regulate inactivity, that the entire idea of regulating commerce presupposes that commerce exists, right? Someone's already engaged in activity. You can't shove someone into activity, because once you shove them into activity, you can make them do anything you want, all right? So this was a very big deal, because now we had a circuit split. We had a circuit split which almost guaranteed Supreme Court review. It wasn't even clear if the Supreme Court would take this case, but now they had to, right? Because at this point, the law had been struck down in, you know, three states, and it couldn't exist in this fractured manner. Now, uh, the president was not happy there. So the next court of appeals is one people don't mention much. It was the fourth court of appeals in Virginia. And it did something a little bit weird. So let me take a step back. I've been talking about the Commerce Clause, Commerce Clause, Commerce Clause. But there's another possible ground on which to uphold the ACA. This was the taxing power. And the argument went something like this. The Affordable Care Act is actually taxing people, right? If you don't have insurance, they impose a tax on you. You pay this amount to the IRS, it's added to your tax return. There are various things about it that make it seem like a tax. But Congress is very deliberate in their wording. They called it a penalty. The president went on national television and said, this is not a tax. This is not a tax. This is not a tax. He said it a number of times. 
Why? Because he had made a campaign pledge not to raise taxes. Okay? And also, every single politician in the world never wants to be one responsible for raising taxes. They don't want to do that. Penalties are fine, right? But, but not taxes. Why does this make a difference? The taxing power is much broader than the commerce power. Congress can do a lot of things under the taxing power that can't do under the commerce power. They can regulate intrastate activity. They can regulate things that never cross state lines through the taxing power. And courts are much more deferential. Social Security, for example, is a tax. That's why it's put on your payroll for every, every paycheck. But there's a problem with the taxing argument. And as we steer close to April 15th, you know this very well. If you get a tax bill from the IRS that you don't like, you have to pay it. You can't challenge it in court right away. The procedure is you pay it under protest, and then you can sue for a refund in court. This is why we don't have people running to court whenever they get a tax bill. This is because of something called the Tax Anti-Injunction Act, the AIA. It stops people from suing on their tax bill before they pay it. Okay? So when is the Obamacare tax going to be paid? Well, maybe never. But you know, when, when was it supposed to be paid? This year, 2014. Had anyone actually paid the Obamacare tax in 2010 when this lawsuit was filed? No. Therefore, the argument goes, if this is a tax and no one's paid it yet, the case isn't ripe. No one can bring suit on the, on the Obamacare tax until it's actually imposed. Okay. So if that's the case, the court should dismiss it for lack of jurisdiction. It's the case isn't ripe yet, right? And initially, the Obama administration liked this argument. They wanted the case to be dismissed. But then they had a realization. It's like, uh-oh, wait a minute. Who's going to be president in 2014? Maybe not me. We can't let this issue linger for four years just in suspense. We need to resolve it now, right? So the government tried to have it both ways, right? They said, oh, Your Honor, uh, uh, it's a tax, but, but the Anti-Injunction Act doesn't apply, which is kind of a weird argument. But I'll get back to that later. The Fourth Circuit said, you know what? This is a tax, and it's a constitutional tax. Okay? But because it's a tax, we can't resolve it yet. Whatever. They have, but they upheld it under the Commerce Clause. Obama was happy. He won. Didn't really care why. But at the D.C. Circuit, though, this was a final court of appeals to hear the case. It was a slightly different position. This is Judge Brett Kavanaugh. And what Judge Kavanaugh said was, if this law was slightly different, right? If instead of calling this a penalty, Congress had called it a tax, it would be perfectly constitutional. He effectively said, if we're able to rewrite the law a little bit, we can uphold it. And the government took notice of this position, right? This idea of rewriting a law to uphold it was, it was a very sensible position because the law as written was not very good on this point. Anyway, the D.C. Circuit ruled for the government and they won. And it's off to the Supreme Court we go. Has anyone been to the Supreme Court? Yeah. Did you wait outside? No. You had tickets, huh? So for most people, the way to get inside the Supreme Court is by waiting online. And I'll give you a pro tip. It's cold, right? And I'll give you another pro tip. The Supreme Court has come on at 3 in the morning. It's a very nice wake-up call. Anyway. So we have, uh, we have the presidency, I'm sorry, we have the Supreme Court oral arguments, okay? And we all know there's no cameras allowed, so the only way to know what's going on is to have, uh, uh, you know, effectively people in the courtroom running out to the street and giving live reports. That's the only way we can know what's going on. They release the audio a couple days later, all right? So at the Supreme Court, there were going to be three days of oral arguments. This was actually quite unprecedented. There had never been in, I think, in several decades, this many hours of arguments for one case. So what were the three days? Day number one, the taxing power. Could Congress, under the taxing power, require people to buy health insurance? And also, does the Anti-Injunction Act bar any kind of a, a lawsuit before 2014? Okay. Day two, Commerce Clause. Does Congress have the power under the Commerce Clause to make people buy health insurance? Day three was a double header. In the morning, they asked, is the mandate severable? In other words, if the mandate is unconstitutional, can we cut it apart and leave the rest of the law intact? Okay? In other words, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Okay? Day three in the afternoon, was the Medicaid expansion constitutional? Right? Was the Medicaid expansion permissible? Could they force the states to take all this money? 
So what's really interesting, though, was on the very first day, not many people were paying attention. People weren't really thinking about the taxing power. But the Solicitor General of the United States, Don Verrilli, a very bright lawyer, made the argument to the court like this. He, he said, basically, Mr. Chief Justice, we're arguing about the wrong thing. There is no individual mandate. He told the court, there is no mandate. There's nothing requiring people to buy health insurance. All there is is a tax on not having insurance. Everyone see the difference? There's nothing requiring you to buy health insurance. There's only a tax on not having insurance. Now, from a practical perspective, what's the difference, right? I'm either being forced to do something or I'm paying a tax for not doing it. But from a constitutional perspective, it makes a very big difference because the taxing power is so broad. And the only way you can get there is by effectively rewriting the law. Okay? The law says penalty. The government said you should read this as a tax, even though it clearly says penalty. Those don't matter for purposes of the Constitution. Okay? But what about the Tax Anti-Injunction Act? If it's a tax, we can't handle 2014. So what did the government say? Well, for purposes of statutory construction of the Anti-Injunction Act, it's not a tax. But for purposes of the Constitution, it is a tax. So the same provision, which is not called a tax, well, is going to be not a tax for one reason, but is a tax for another. This is a government's argument in a nutshell. And you want to know what? It worked. The position the Chief Justice adopted is verbatim from the government's briefs. He basically took the government's argument and ran with it. Okay? On day two, the Solicitor General's biggest foe was a glass of water. Uh, he actually had, uh, he had done six practice moots the week before to get ready for argument, and he lost his voice. So, pro tip, right before he goes to the podium, he takes a sip of water, and it goes down the wrong pipe, and he's up there from the entire Supreme Court, and he starts gagging and choking, and there are nine seconds of silence where the guy can't breathe. You can actually hear him getting for a glass of water, the little glass keeps clinking around, and he's trying to take a sip. Not good. The entire world is watching him. This is how he, this was his opening 10 seconds, too. He choked right at the beginning. Not good. He recovered. He recovered. But it was, it, it was pretty dicey. But the problem on day two for the government was on the Commerce Clause. The government is not willing to identify any limits on their commerce powers, right? They wouldn't identify any limits. They asked questions about, you know, broccoli, right? Can, uh, yeah, here, here it is. Can, yeah, Scalia. Scalia got the broccoli question, right? They asked, can Congress make you buy broccoli, right? Can Congress make you buy a General Motors vehicle, right? If we allow Congress to make you buy health insurance, what other products can we make them buy? And the government didn't have a very good answer to this, and this was somewhat deliberate. Their answer, their answer was, we don't want to limit the government's position. In other words, maybe the government will want to make a broccoli mandate next year. Who knows, right? We don't want to box the government in to saying, here is the outer bound of our power. So when that happened, the court said, okay, we'll draw the line for you. And what's that line going to be? You cannot regulate economic inactivity. You cannot force people into commerce. That's the line. Okay. There are other arguments about severability which are not nearly as interesting, but I want to turn to the Medicaid expansion because, again, it began in your very state. So the way Medicaid works is that the federal government gives a boatload of money to the states, and they're required to administer this health care program for people who are poor and who are sick uh, uh, in various ways, very strict requirements. Okay? At the start, Medicaid covered those at the poverty line. The Obamacare law saw it to extend 3% of the poverty line. All right? Now, what might happen, you ask, if a state decides, no thanks, we don't want the new money, let's keep it as it is. Okay? So Governor Jan Brewer of Arizona, who's been in the news of late, sends a letter to the government in 2010. She says, hey, you know, what happens if we don't participate in this new expansion program? Can we keep our old money? And what did the government say? No. If you do not participate in the expansion, we will take away your entire budget for Medicaid, $8 billion. So effectively, states had a choice. They could either participate in this program or lose their entire Medicaid funding, which would bankrupt the state immediately. So what Paul Clement argued is, 
hey, look, we have this letter from Arizona. There's no meaningful choice, right? There's no choice. It's like putting a gun to it and saying your money or your life, right? You're going to give your money. That the states were being coerced, to use the words of the court, into accepting this doctrine. Okay? And you want to know what? The government had no good answer to that. They spent two years trying to run away from that Arizona letter. They were trying to, like, not acknowledge it, but it was there in the record. Right? They said, oh, we would never do that to Arizona. We would never take away the money. But it was right there in writing. It said they would, very clearly. So, on this point, the government was going to lose. After the decision, everyone thought that Justice Kennedy, who's often the swing vote, would be the deciding vote. But, in fact, it would be Chief Justice Roberts who would, who would cast the deciding vote. And... There's a lot of speculation and rumors about the Chief Justice changing his vote in response to perhaps pressure or intimidation from the outside. Uh, what I can tell you, I talk about this in the book, is that at the conference, you know, the, the Monday after uh, oral arguments, I'm sorry, the Friday after oral arguments, the Chief Justice was pretty much set on striking down on Commerce Clause grounds. But, it's, but he did, was not set on the taxing power. He was somewhat wavering. And at some point in, you know, mid-April, the Chief Justice decided that he would vote to uphold it as a tax. And the other justices knew about this well in advance. They weren't frantically trying to sway over at the last minute. This was a done deal. So the Chief Justice decided that he would uphold it as a tax. How would he do this? Exactly as the government said. It's not a tax for purpose of the Anti-Injunction Act, but it is a tax for purpose of the Constitution. And oh, by the way, there's no actual mandate. It's only a tax not having insurance. That doesn't really make sense. Read the opinion a couple dozen times. This makes even less sense then. Uh, the, the, the opinion was a very deliberate way of upholding the statute, but it, it tortured the actual law that Congress wrote. Had Congress called it a tax in 2010, it would have never, ever, ever passed. Not a chance. Right? Also interesting, Robert said there's no actual mandate. Even though the entire law was fought over having a mandate. This was actually something you had to do. So there was actually a joint opinion by Justices Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito. Four votes that was struck down the entire Affordable Care Act, every, all 3,000 pages. There was another opinion by Justice Thomas, who would have reversed most of the 20th century and brought us back to the, <laughs> brought us back to the old Lochner court. Uh, uh, interestingly, enough, interestingly enough, Justices Breyer and Kagan joined the Medicaid opinion. And so instead of striking down the Medicaid expansion, what the court did was they gave states a choice. They said, okay, we're not going to force you to enter this new program. You have the choice. But once you opt in, you're in forever. So what you'll see now is states one by one entering. I know Governor Rick Scott's had a big fuss in Tallahassee trying to enter. Governor Brewer's trying to do the same. Uh, my state will be the last state in the union to join. I don't think Texas will ever do it. Uh, uh, Someone to the detriment of the poor people of Texas who have no shot at getting this uh, health insurance. Justices Ginsburg and Sotomayor have upheld the entire thing. Uh, and so that was a law. So a couple of funny points. There are no cameras in the court, right? So the only way that the people on the reporters in the street could find out what was going on was by actually reading the opinion. So minutes after the decision was released, you have this entire army of interns with the 200-page opinion hand running out of the court in their sneakers and handing the opinion to the reporter from CNN. Okay, What's wrong with that headline? Was the mandate struck down? No. So what happened? The reporter... You can see her live on Wolf Blitzer show. It's reading from page three of the syllabus where it says, the court finds that the mandate violates the Commerce Clause. And she stopped there. And she told Wolf Blitzer, Wolf, uh, this violates the Commerce Clause. CNN goes wall to wall, sending out millions of emails, putting it on the front page of the website. Mandate struck down, right? Even funnier, guess who's watching CNN? <laughs> President of the United States was watching CNN. He thought for about eight minutes his law was unconstitutional. <laughs> and it was actually funny. One of his inner people had to go to his office and say, Mr. President, thumbs up. He's like, but I saw it on CNN. Fox also messed it up. You can actually see Megyn Kelly reading from SCOTUS blog on her iPad. It was actually pretty funny. Uh, they, they, they messed it up. In the end, the law was upheld. Uh, Dewey defeats Truman. You know, the, 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 the president's law was upheld. Uh, John Roberts did a little jujitsu with the Constitution. Uh, uh, he was lambasting the media. Now let's briefly talk about what happened after the case decided. So if the Republicans were trying to genetically engineer the worst possible candidate to run on the most important issue of 2012, it would be him. They couldn't have done worse. Why? 
because he invented Obamacare. He invented it. In Massachusetts, he imposed Romney care, which was effectively an individual mandate for a state. Now, there's some difference between the state and the Fed. No one cares. Every single time healthcare was brought up in the debate, oh, there's a blue tie, right? Said, you are the godfather of Obamacare. This is <laughs> right. So I used to end my talk here, right? This used to be the end of my talk. Because I, I, when I submitted this book, I thought, okay, you know what? It's been fun, but the battle of Obamacare is over. Not really. Inauguration, right? Constitution, and then Ted Cruz, right? My my beloved junior senator, who filibustered for almost 23 hours to shut down the federal government over Obamacare. And this, remember the barricades? Feels like forever ago, right? And this was just the start, because then we go to our poor friend Adrian. This is Adrian. She was the the face of healthcare.gov, not one of her better strategic decisions in life. She wasn't even paid for this photo. She did this for free headshots, uh, this poor, poor girl. So the launch of that website was an absolute disaster. Um, for months, it didn't work. It was an absolute nightmare. These are from The Onion. Uh, and people spent weeks and weeks trying to fix it. People spent just waiting and waiting. It was, I mean, if you want to launch something and, and build confidence, this is not how you do it. So the president said, we need to fix this by December 1st. And you know what? In fairness, it's actually working pretty good now. Does anyone use it? Do people use it? One people, OK. So my class is the same, right? So the website's actually working. So that phase of the battle's gone. But the next phase are these. Anyone got one of these? Cancellation notices? OK. If I, if I do this tonight, and for the lawyers, they'll probably know about this more. One of the things of the ACA is it requires insurers to give what's called essential coverage, which means certain uh, 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 Things that they deem essential to health care includes like prenatal care and contraceptive, these various things. If your plan does not conform with that under the law, insurers are required to cancel it. Okay? Millions of these cancellation notices went out this past year. Okay? People do not like their stuff getting canceled. This was a lesson that Hillary Care learned very well. Okay? What's going on now, and this, this is something that's happening even yesterday, is that the president has made many unilateral delays to the law. To delay, he's actually pushing cancellation notices past the election, right? And there's not much reason other than pushing the cancellation notices past the election. He's making it so that your policy can be non-conforming for the next two years. Okay? Does he have any authority to do this? No, zero. Right? The, the, the law says begins in 2014, and he just said now to make that 16. So does anyone have standing to challenge it? Probably not. And this has been the modus operandi of Obamacare. Delay, 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 don't enforce this, don't enforce that, exempt those groups, don't exempt these groups. Uh, and, and in fairness to the president, he is sabotaging his own law in many respects. Uh, this is going to make it very difficult to build a, a risk pool that has enough diversity. Um, uh, also, things called risk corridor, payments to insurance companies for losing amounts of money. Uh, so the insurance companies are, are in bed with this. They can't stop it. Uh, so... One minute on Hobby Lobby. So this is a follow-up case uh, of another revision of the Affordable Care Act called the Contraceptive Mandate. Okay? And what does a contraceptive mandate do? It says that if you have more than 50 employees, you're required to give certain, certain forms of uh, contraceptives and abortion patients to your employees. Okay? Hobby Lobby, which is a company owned by a Christian family, a private corporation, says this violates our religious liberties under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. This will be argued in about three weeks in front of the Supreme Court, and this could be a serious blow to the efforts to try to uh, force employers to give out these various contraceptives. Now, this is a long arc that I've just traced from the 1990s to the passage of Obamacare to its challenge in court to the 2012 election to the 2014 election and really to the 2016 election. I'm actually writing a sequel to this book because there's so much new stuff to talk about. Uh, I have very brief time, but I thank you for your attention. I welcome Professor Cap to... Uh, uh, to provide some uh, comments in, in our, our remaining time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks very much for the invitation to be here. Um, make a few comments. It's a great uh, historical background. Uh, you know, it's, as Professor Blackman indicated, where we go from here. Yogi Barra, it's always difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. Um, 
There's not going to be a repeal. There's not going to be a legislative repeal. Although, uh, as the professor indicated, uh, it may well be that by delaying and chipping away to executive order and to the regulatory process, uh, whether or not there's a repeal may not even matter because uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act, as it's implemented uh, over the next few years, uh, may end up not being implemented in whole or, or at least look very different than, uh, than it did when it was passed. Um, also, the uncertainty uh, regarding uh, challenges, uh, constitutional challenges, they're working their way through the court. Uh, the Hobby Lobby case, which will be argued March 25th, was mentioned. Another big one that is working its way through the, the lower federal courts now, and I suspect will inevitably end up uh, at the Supreme Court, is uh, a rule uh, promulgated by the uh, Internal Revenue Service that would allow subsidies for people purchasing individual health policies uh, on federal exchanges. In other words, in states like Florida that haven't set up state exchanges. The statute, the Affordable Care Act, says people who purchase uh, private policies through state exchanges are eligible for the federal subsidies. The Internal Revenue Service wrote a rule which arguably, and I would, I would agree with this argument myself, uh, conflicts with the statute that gave the IRS authority to write the rule. So uh, it's going to be a very interesting uh, administrative law question that, uh, that uh, will eventually I think, end up in the Supreme Court. And uh, should that IRS regulation be struck down, should uh, the court say that federal subsidies for individual, purchase, individual policy purchases are only available to people who purchase their policies in states that have state exchanges, uh, that's going to operationally deal a pretty significant blow to, uh, to the whole scheme of the Affordable Care Act. So we have to, have to stay uh, awake to, uh, to, to developments that are going to happen. I look forward to, to seeing their sequel. I look forward to seeing the facts unfold that will be chronicled in your sequel. Um, having said that, there are lots of changes that have been going on over the last few years in the uh, organization and operation of the health care financing delivery system that predated the Affordable Care Act and that will go on regardless of what happens legally with the Affordable Care Act. Consolidations in the health care industry, mergers and acquisitions, uh, hospitals and other health care entities going out of business. Um, physicians more and more being not independent practitioners the way they historically have been, but employees of larger healthcare corporations. Today, over 50% of physicians are employees of hospitals or other healthcare uh, corporate entities. That's going to continue, that's going to grow. Uh, so, a number of the trends that are going to affect how healthcare is financed and delivered uh, are going to keep occurring uh, and, and moving uh, regardless of what happens with the Affordable Care Act. Um, there's a comment on the Commerce Clause uh, argument. Um, there was a group of uh, people who identified themselves as the health law professors in America, and basically you know, people like my counterparts at other law schools who teach health law courses who, who specialize in scholarship on health law issues, who got together and about 90 percent of them, was quite a large number, uh, submitted a, an amicus in the National Federation of Independent Businesses uh, case in which uh, it's called the Health Law Professors Brief, you can look it up online, Health Law Professors Brief argued that the Commerce Clause uh, was broad enough to uh, include uh, what was the, the individual mandate. Um, don't worry about broccoli. Uh, Congress already has the authority under the Commerce Clause to make you buy broccoli, but of course they never do that. 
that was basically their argument, is don't worry about it, court, uh, because, yes, it would lead to a ridiculous result, but it'll never happen, so just, just assume that it's not a problem. I actually, I, I did not sign that brief, and I actually wrote an article was, uh, while the case was pending. Uh, it was in the American Journal of Law and Medicine, and the title, I would hate to misquote myself, so it's really good. <laughs> if we can force people to purchase health insurance, then let's force them to be treated too. In which I argued that if the court was going to, to hold that the uh, Commerce Clause was that broad, uh, that if Congress could basically exercise the federal police power uh, to promote the health of the American population, then why stop at forcing people to buy insurance? Why not? And why stop at forcing people to buy broccoli? Why not force people, why not use the commerce power to force people to eat that broccoli and to do other things like accept medical care uh, that will make them healthier and that will have an impact on society because it will keep down health care costs uh, and so on. So, you know, the example I use is if I refuse to take my medicine to uh, control my hypertension, I put myself at a higher risk of having a stroke or a heart attack. That's going to lead to less economic productivity. If I can't work, it's going to cost society money to pay for my health care. Um, if the power of, of Congress under the Commerce Clause really is untabbed, which is the language that was used in the arguments, if there really are no limits, then why not really do it right? Why not really make the American population more healthy? by forcing people to engage in health-promoting activities, such as eating broccoli and accepting uh, indicated medical, medical interventions. Uh, so, and, and, I, and I took great glee by the fact and, and, uh, took glee in the fact that the health law professor's brief was on the wrong side of the decision. Um, but, they don't think they were. Okay. Uh, yeah, why don't, why don't I stop? Okay, any questions? Yeah. You want to have any questions? Yes, sir. So, I hear a lot. Um, sorry, the, because it, the bill did technically originate, originate in the House and it's a tax. That is, that is constitutional problem because the taxing bill has to originate in the House. Can you just listen? Right, okay. So, so, so here's the deal, actually. And I have a, I have a slide about this. Okay, so, uh, ba -ba -ba. so the Affordable Care Act, as I said, began in the Senate, right? Began in the Senate, then went to the House, and the President signed it into law, okay? Taxes under the Constitution are required to originate in the House of Representatives. Did Obamacare originate in the House? No, it began in the Senate. But you probably didn't even notice this. See this right here? H.R. 3590. That means House Resolution 3590. How is it that that is a House Resolution designation? Something called a shell bill, which is exactly what it sounds like. Where Congress had a, sh a bill that started in the House, they sent it to the Senate, they gutted it, deleted everything, and put Obamacare into it. So they effectively have a parlor game where they have a House bill, sent it to the Senate, and it becomes a Senate bill of the House origination. That's the government's argument. Now, no court has ever struck down law based on the origination clause. This might be the first one. I'm not confident, but this is currently pending for the D.C. Circuit. The other case that Professor Kapp mentioned is the, uh, uh, the Halbig case about the Obamacare exchanges. And the way Obamacare is written, as you said, is that only state-run exchanges can offer subsidies. IRS wrote a rule that says, no, federal exchanges can offer subsidies too. It's plainly on, uh, against the text of the statute, but courts have upheld it. All right. One more question? No more questions. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it.